Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Last time on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. If you've ever lost a loved one, whether a parent, a spouse, a child, or even just a friend, you know the pain of separation. You can't just call them on the phone or arrange to visit with them. Wouldn't it be great if you could see their face, hear their voice, feel their touch, or smell their aroma again? Well, millions of people report just this. They report spontaneous experiences of contact with their departed loved ones. They even report spontaneously receiving messages from their loved ones. These experiences are known as after-death communications, or ADCs and they are an increasing object of scientific study. So what are after-death communications? What are they like? And could they really be forms of contact with our lost loved ones? Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? Next week, we're going to go into analysis mode and look at after-death communications from the perspectives of faith and reason. What does reason say about them? Do we have any evidence that they're more than just wishful thinking in the midst of grief? you know, after losing a loved one. And if we do have such evidence, what are the implications from the faith perspective? You're listening to episode 307 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're analyzing after-death communications. I'm Don Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. After a loved one dies, many people report having an after-death communication with them. It may involve sensing their presence, or it may involve a sensory experience of them, including seeing, hearing, and touching them, and feeling them like they're a physical object that just materialized. But what do faith and reason say about these experiences? Are they just due to people's imaginations? Is it just the grief talking? And... Could it be demons? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Now, last week we surveyed the different types of after-death communications that are reported, and Jimmy, you promised that this week we'd be going into analysis mode. Where do you want to start today's episode? Basically, by listing the theories that could possibly explain after-death communications, and we'll put them into three general categories. Natural explanations paranormal explanations, and supernatural explanations. And then, depending on what we find, we'll have some questions from the faith perspective. Then let's start, as always in a paranormal investigation, with possible natural explanations. What might they be? Well, first, hoaxes, because people always hoax. Uh, Second, mental illness, because some people are always mentally ill. Third, misperception of objective phenomena, because some people always misperceive objective things that are happening around them. And fourth, imagination, because people do have subjective experiences that are purely natural and that aren't based on anything in their environment, uh, particularly when they're under intense stress, like times of intense grief, and also particularly when they're dreaming. Assuming those don't fully explain after-death communications, what paranormal explanations are there? First, there's the possibility of what's known as living agent psi, which would mean that a living person is psychically responsible for what happens in an ADC, and second, that they are what they appear to be, communications with deceased loved ones. You also mentioned supernatural explanations. What would those involve? Well, in Latin, super means above, and so ADCs could have a cause that was above human nature, making them supernatural. That cause could be God, and God is above human nature, so God could be facilitating communication between the living and the deceased. Or it could be a created spirit that is above human nature, in other words, an angel. So good angels might be involved, or bad angels, demons, might be involved because it's always demons. All right. Then let's look at after-death communications from the reason perspective. What do you think about the natural explanations in general? I'm sure they all play a role. Uh, People do always hoax things in every area of life, and I'm sure that applies here. Some ADCs are undoubtedly conscious hoaxes, but nowhere near all of them. 
as we heard last episode, it looks like 40 to 50% of the population reports having at least one ADC. And 40 to 50% of the population aren't committing conscious hoaxes when they do this. At most, only a tiny fraction of people would be doing so. Consequently, while I'm sure that some ADCs are hoaxes, it's only a tiny number of them. So hoaxing is not a good general explanation of the phenomenon. What about mental illness? Well, some people are mentally ill, and that can produce hallucinations of all different sorts. As a result, I'm sure that some ADC reports are products of mental illness. But again, not 40 to 50 percent of the population, and only a tiny, tiny percentage of the population has mental illness of the kind that produces hallucinations. So this is not a good general explanation of the phenomenon. Further, one of the things that researchers have consistently found is that the large majority of people who experience ADCs are just not mentally ill. As we heard last episode, ADCs used to be called hallucinations of the sane because the people who had them were having sensory experiences that didn't seem to have an objective basis, but they were clearly sane. So mental illness is not a good overall explanation. What about the misperception of, of objective phenomena that you referred to, and what would that mean? Well, it would mean that uh, something in the experiencer's environment really did take place. There was an objectively real event, but it was one that was misperceived as an after-death communication when it actually wasn't one. For example, last episode we heard about symbolic ADCs. These are situations in which there is no direct perception of the loved one. Instead, the experience see something and interpret it as a symbol or sign caused by or sent by their loved one. Uh, thus, one of the experiences we heard about was from a woman named Carolyn at her daughter's funeral. And on that occasion, a big white butterfly landed on her daughter's casket and stayed there. A nun then told her that butterflies are symbols of the resurrection, and Caroline concluded that the butterfly was a sign from her daughter. Now, if someone told me that they had this experience, I wouldn't challenge them on it. The butterfly could well be a sign from the daughter, but there is not proof that this is the case. Butterflies land on things and then rest all the time. Uh, one could have landed on her daughter's casket purely by coincidence, and so, in principle, Caroline could have misperceived a purely natural occurrence as an ADC. You know, humans are pattern matching machines. We see meaningful connections between random bits of data, which is what we evolved to do. You know, it promotes your chance of survival if you attribute meaning to chance events, like the wind rustling the grass behind you. You know, if you attribute significance to it, like thinking there's a predator there that might kill you, you're more likely to survive than if you say, ah, it's just the wind blowing the grass, and then the beast of Gévaudan leaps out and kills you. So it's safer for us if we initially attribute significance to random things and then find out that they're not actually significant. Well, that pattern match matching ability is the kind of thing that would let us see something random and attribute it as a meaningful and comforting communication from one of our deceased loved ones. Do you think that this kind of potential misperception applies to the category of symbolic after-death communications as a whole? I think that it's an explanation that has some plausibility across the category of symbolic ADCs, but it doesn't apply to them all equally. The more unlikely something is to occur by random chance, the less the mis misperception argument would apply. For example, last week we heard about an ADC from a man named Al who saw a butterfly and thought it might be a sign from his daughter. So he invited it to do something strange and let him know if that was the case. The butterfly then landed on his finger and stayed there for a really long time. It stayed while he finished his cigar. It stayed while he went into his house. It stayed while he went to the sink and got a glass of water. And it stayed while he drank the glass of water, which is unusual behavior for a butterfly. So I think the misperception argument applies less well to this case than to the first one where all the butterfly did was land on a casket. Similarly, we also heard about a woman named Lucy whose son had regularly given her dimes as a private joke. He said it was her allowance for being a good mother, and then after he died, she and her husband started finding dimes everywhere. 
they kept a running tally and they found 640 dimes over the next nine years, which works out to both of them finding three dimes each every month for nine years. That is a lot of dimes. It's not impossible they would find that many, and they were looking for them, but it's another instance where the misperception explanation fits less well, since the proposed sign happened so many times. It sounds like you think there's a misperception risk in the symbolic ADC category, but you don't think that it always fits well. Are there particular cases where you think it's hard to explain an ADC as just something happening randomly and then misinterpreted? Yes, and this gets us to some cases that I held back last episode because of the evidential value they have. For example, here is a story from a woman named Cecilia whose eight-year-old daughter Holly died of leukemia. The story involves a sparkling wine known as Baby Duck, and yes, many parents let their children have small drinks of wine so that it's not a forbidden fruit to them and they learn to use alcohol responsibly so that they don't grow up to become alcoholics. Cecilia says, Holly was sick for about 19 months, and I was with her day and night. Every night she would wake me up for a midnight snack. One evening, about two weeks before her passing, she said, Mommy, instead of having a midnight snack, why don't we have a drink tonight? Can I have some baby duck? So I said yes. And every night after that, Holly woke me up for her midnight drink of baby duck, which is a sparkling beverage. After that bottle was empty, a friend brought a new one. Holly was fiddling with the foil and the wire, but she was too weak to open it. I asked her, do you want mommy to open it for you? And she said, no, I will open it myself when I'm strong enough. The next day, Holly passed away, and the unopened bottle was put on our china cabinet in the living room. Three days later, at exactly midnight, there was a noise. When we looked at the bottle of baby duck, the cork had popped out and hit the ceiling and had come down beside it. The bottle hadn't been tampered with, and there was no excessive heat in the house to cause that to happen. Then I felt Holly's presence and knew she was there with us, and I realized she was telling me, yes, now I'm strong enough. I opened the bottle of Baby Duck myself. I think that's a really touching story, and I do think it's harder to explain as just random chance. It's not impossible to explain it that way, but it's striking that right at the end of her life, Holly started wanting to have a midnight snack of baby duck. Then she was too weak to open the new bottle and said that she'd open it when she was strong enough to do so. And then after she passed, pop, right at midnight, the usual time for her drink in that final two weeks, the bottle opened all by itself. It's not impossible to say that's coincidence, but it's very striking. Then there's this account from a woman named Irene, whose husband Jacob died of cancer at age 76. After my husband passed away, one of my neighbors called to tell me that the local tax bill was due in December. Jacob had always taken care of paying the taxes. He had been an attorney and had an office in our home where he kept all of his papers and legal files. He kept very accurate records and would not let anyone touch them. So I had no idea where to look for the tax bill or even what it looked like. I spent all day looking and couldn't find it. I was so frustrated and angry. There I was, left with this responsibility of taking care of something that I knew nothing about. I stood in the middle of his office and started to cry. I screamed, How could you do this to me, Jacob? How could you leave? How could you leave me with all this to do? Suddenly, as I was standing there, Jacob's appointment book opened. It's a fairly thick book with a hard cover. The book had been closed on his desk and I saw it open. I couldn't believe what I had just seen, so I walked over and looked. The book was opened to a page in December, and there was the tax bill. And I just said, thank you, Jacob. This incident also reveals Jacob's system for paying his future bills to Iris, and it involves a thick book with a hard cover suddenly opening and showing her where the tax bill was. Right at the moment, she cried out in frustration about this. Well, closed books don't normally open by their own on random chance, so unless there were very strong winds in Jacob's office that Iris doesn't mention, we wouldn't expect this to happen at all, much less for it to open to the exact thing she was so frustrated about. It looks like Jacob knew her frustration and 
psychokinetically opened the hardcover book to the right place that she needed. Then there's this experience from, from a woman named Rebecca, whose grandmother had died of heart failure six months previously. It was quite late, and my husband and I had done our usual routine. We had checked the kids, locked the front and back doors, and turned off all the lights. Then we turned in. Something awakened me from a very sound, dreamless sleep. I sat up and realized Granny was sitting on the foot of my bed. I sensed her presence more strongly than I could actually see her, but I could see she was smiling at me. I woke up my husband and said, Granny is here. Look, she's sitting down by my feet. He couldn't see anything and said I was crazy. Now, up to this point, you could dismiss this encounter as just a dream that Rebecca had, but then this happened. Then we heard something from the living room. We looked at each other, got up, and headed that way. The stereo and every light in the room were on. The dining room was lit up too. Even the kitchen light was on and the oven light. We were really freaking out. As we passed the back door, it was unlocked and the outdoor light was on. Then we decided to go down to the family room in the basement. There the television was going and all the lights were blazing too. My husband went around to the outside of the house and found the front door light on as well. There was nothing that could be on that wasn't on. Everything was going. Everything. From that point on, I felt a sense of peace about Granny. Deep in my heart, I knew she had come back to say goodbye to us. I know she is never far away. She is just in another realm. So Rebecca's husband dismisses her account of the ADC from her grandmother and wham! All of the lights and the appliances in the house turn on. Either their kids, for some reason, manage to sneak out of bed and turn everything on just at the right time and then get back into bed without their parents noticing, or misperception of a natural event doesn't really fit this instance as a good explanation. And finally, since we've crossed over into the realm where Rebecca actually had a sensory ADC because she saw her grandmother, not just a symbol of her, I'd point out that the misperception of objective events explanation is going to have significant problems with sensory ADCs. We should point out that Rebecca's visual ADC occurred right when she woke up, and you said it might have been a dream. Maybe her dream center was still active and producing the image of her grandmother while she was in the hip no pompic or waking up state that gets us to the fourth potential natural explanation you mentioned imaginary subjective experiences which can happen when people are dreaming or in times of great stress like intense grief how well does this explanation fare we need to distinguish between the two states being asleep and being in grief when it comes to sleep state adcs we noted that the international survey we looked at uh, for statistics indicated that 62% of ADCs occur in dreams, and that's a majority of them. We also noted that there is a basis for distinguishing sleep state ADCs from regular dreams. According to experience, um, sleep state ADCs frequently seem unusually vivid, more so than a regular dream. They can feel realer than real, and they seem more coherent and purposeful than a regular dream. Normal dreams are more randomly shifting and illogical in the elements they contain. Later in the episode, I'll give an example from my own experience of what may have been an ADC from my late wife, Renee, and how it's different than the other dreams I had about her after her death. Further, ADCs often begin when a person is asleep, so the person is having a dream, and then the loved one suddenly shows up, and then the experiencer wakes up and the loved one is still there, and the ADC continues even while the person is awake. But despite all this, I'm quite sure that many cases that people perceive as sleep state ADCs are likely to just be natural dreams and there's nothing paranormal about them. I don't think that applies to all situations where a person is asleep, but I'm willing to grant it for purposes of discussion that it, it may be a lot of them. What about the other situation where people who are awake imagine things, particularly when they're grieving a lost loved one intensely so that their imaginations run away with them in a kind of wish fulfillment? Well, here again, I have no doubt that this explains some reported ADCs, perhaps many or even most waking ones. I can imagine a person's subconscious 
making a person feel like they were, for example, quickly touched, and then they imagine they were touched by their lost loved one. And I can imagine a person's subconscious causing them to imagine that they heard someone calling their name, or even say a short phrase like, Daddy, I love you. I can even imagine people having a kind of wish-fulfillment imaginary conversation with their loved one and then thinking it was real. But I don't think this proposal can explain all waking ADCs. I would propose several problems for this view as a general explanation of waking ADCs. And the first one is that they don't always involve someone who's actively grieving. Here are four reasons why that's not the case. First, This was something that the international study in French, English, and Spanish asked about, and in the El Cesar booklet published about it, the researchers reported the following. 36% of respondents said that they were extremely sad and in deep mourning when the ADC occurred. 14% said they were moderately sad and moderately mourning. And 17% said that they were a little sad and had partially overcome the pain of mourning. Now, that all adds up to basically two-thirds, or 67% of people, being in one stage of mourning or another when the ADC occurred. But 13% said that they were not sad and were not in mourning anymore, meaning that their grieving process was complete. This would certainly apply to the cases that happened many years after the loved one's death. And as we heard last episode, ADCs can happen even decades after the person's death. Thus, we heard about one that occurred 33 years after the loved one died. And what's more, 14% of the respondents said they had never been in mourning for the deceased person, which would include people who just never liked the dead person to begin with and thus didn't grieve them upon their death. In any event, Between the 14% who never grieved the person and the 13% who had finished their grieving process, 27% of the respondents, more than one in four, said they were not in grief at all when the ADC happened. So the grief influences imagination in the direction of wish fulfillment hypothesis won't explain those. You said that there were several problems you would propose for the grief-induced imagination theory. What's the next? Aside from the fact that many of the respondents said that they were not grieving or had never grieved, some who have had ADCs could not have been grieving for the simple reason they didn't know the person they saw in the ADC was dead. For example, here's an experience reported by a bereavement counselor named Edith, who had been working with a patient named Howard who had died at age 65 of ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. She says... I was at home when the nurse from hospice called to tell me Howard was actively dying, a process that can go on for hours. His wife was having a real difficult time and wanted me to come over and be there with her. I said, of course, and went to change my clothes. I was in my walk-in closet when all of a sudden I experienced Howard's presence. He was there on my right side. There was a lightness of being, a joy and a sense of freedom. It was like I heard in my heart his goodbye and to thank you for being there for him, as I had been. He wasn't there long, probably about 30 seconds. When I stepped out of the closet, I looked at our digital clock, which said 4.23. I proceeded to get dressed and drove to Howard's house. When I walked in, they told me he had passed on at 4.23. So in this case, Edith had only a professional relationship with Howard and his wife. She did know that Howard was in the process of dying, but as she says, that process can take hours. Then, as she was getting ready, she felt Howard's presence at 4.23, and that turned out to be the very time he died. As a professional, she no doubt had sympathy for Howard and his wife, but she wouldn't be experiencing actual grief of the kind a family member would. And she knew the time he died before this was revealed to her through normal means. That's significant, but here's an account from a swimming coach named Warren who was not grieving because he did not know his father had died. My pattern for 30 years has been to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go swimming. I was doing my laps, and when I got to the end of the pool, I felt my father say, I am in heaven now. Don't worry about me. I feel fine. I'm really happy. 
all the burdens and problems that were on my shoulders are gone. I realized Dad was speaking to me internally. I lay back in the water and paused for about five minutes. It was like my father was encompassing me totally with his spirit. It was such a peaceful and positive experience that I can't even describe it. When I went back to my house, my sister called to let me know Dad had died at 3.44 that morning of respiratory failure. And here's an experience from a woman named Melinda who had absolutely no idea whatsoever that her friend Tom had died. Tom and I grew up together. We were next door neighbors, but I hadn't seen him since he entered the priesthood. I lost complete contact with him and his family after I moved to Texas. One night, over ten years later, I woke up out of a sound sleep. I saw Tom standing at the bottom of my bed in a Navy uniform. When I saw his uniform, I couldn't believe it, because I thought he was a Catholic priest. He said, Goodbye, Melinda. I'm leaving now. And he disappeared. My husband woke up and I told him what had happened, but he said I was just dreaming. Three days later, I got a letter from my mother stating that Tom had just been killed in action. I found out that he had been a chaplain in the Navy. So Melinda was definitely not grieving because she hadn't seen him in over 10 years and had no idea he was going to die. Her ADC also included veridical information that he had become a Navy chaplain in addition to becoming a priest. Now, here's an account of what happened to a woman named Sue Ellen when she was 24 years old. I was lying on the sofa. Suddenly, I saw my father very clearly. He was definitely there with me. I could see his smiling face. I heard him say, It's all right, honey. It's beautiful over here. I'm really happy, so don't you worry. Then he laughed and added, Now, I don't have to pay for all that furniture your mom and sister bought. Of course, I didn't know what he meant. Almost simultaneously, the phone was ringing. I could hear my husband in the background saying, Oh my gosh! He learned that my father had just died from a heart attack. My father was only 53 and had been in excellent health. After that, we got a letter saying my mother and sister had gone out and bought a house full of furniture just before my father died. But my father's insurance paid for all of it. This was verification for me that my experience was real. I believe my father came to me because he wanted to be the first one to tell me he had died. This was a totally unexpected death. Sue Ellen's father was only 53 years old and in excellent health, yet he suddenly dropped dead from a heart attack. Sue Ellen had no way of foreseeing his death, so she definitely wasn't grieving him, yet it was swiftly confirmed that he had died, and furthermore, her ADC contained the vertical information that her mother and sister had just bought a bunch of furniture and that he wouldn't have to pay for it because it turned out the insurance did. We thus see that there are quite a number of waking ADCs that could not be grief-induced because the experiencer either did not know that the loved one had died or even had any idea that the loved one was dying. Are there any other circumstances where grief could not have induced the after-death communications? There's a special class of experiences had by people who you would not expect to have grief-triggered ADCs. Uh, This is a class of people who did not know the departed person at all. Uh, To set this up, let's consider the common near-death experiences or NDEs that are often reported. You know, they typically occur in hospitals. They frequently include out-of-body experiences where the dying person sees their body from above and they see the doctors and nurses and medical technicians trying to revive them. You know, those happen in hospitals and deaths in hospitals are frequently expected because that's where people who are in danger of dying are taken. But sometimes deaths occur before the patient gets to the hospital, and outside a hospital or hospice, deaths are much less expected. And so what happens if one dies on the scene before an ambulance can get them to the hospital? In a 2002 paper, researcher Richard Kelly writes, Narrowing the focus to the moments surrounding death, particularly one that is unexpected, one can postulate that the dead or dying individual might be confused, vulnerable, or frightened during the transition from physical life. Stephen Levine remarked on this very question, I now see that a sudden death may not be as fortunate as we have been conditioned to believe. 
Someone who has popped out of their body without much preparation, like a teenager in the fullness of life who has a fatal accident, may, after the smoke clears, wonder, what the hell was that all about? What happened to my body? I can't be dead because this is still happening around me. Near-death literature abounds with reports of individuals observing the scenes of their near-death experience, NDE, often from a position of hovering above, and many confirm the Levine hypothesis of disbelief and confusion. Levine cited an account of a friend who reported watching police and fire personnel during an NDE in the aftermath of a car crash and trying to decide whether or not to get in the ambulance with his body. Many NDE accounts describe attempts by the dying or dead individual to contact people at the scene, nearly unanimously without success. So with these indications of confused deceased people who died in emergency situations like car crashes, Kelly, who is himself a retired detective lieutenant from the Massachusetts State Police, decided to do two studies of firemen, uh, police, and emergency medical service personnel. He did a smaller preliminary study in 1992 and a larger one in 2002. In the smaller preliminary study, Kelly spoke with six individuals, four police officers and two paramedic firefighters, and they reported what would be sentient ADCs, except for the fact that they didn't know the people involved. Describing four cases, Kelly writes, In the first case, the emergency service workers felt the victim was clinging to them in some way that was difficult to describe. In the second case, the emergency service workers felt the victim was watching them. In the third case, the emergency service worker felt a bonding to the deceased immediately after eye contact and later as if he was on your back. In the fourth case, eye contact was part of a continuing personal and strong connection to a victim along with a nagging sense of unfinished business. And it's really tragic, but I can imagine how someone who had just died in a horrible accident could be clinging to the emergency service personnel, urgently hoping that they could do something about his death. For the larger study, Kelly did a study of 90 emergency service workers. This included uh, 90 Massachusetts police officers and 23 paramedic firefighters. They were asked, have you ever felt a presence, communication of some kind, or a feeling of attachment from a deceased victim? 33% of the workers said yes. One subject described three experiences. Three subjects reported feelings of presence at all death scenes, and one subject identified 17 events, and two other respondents, due to their lengthy careers, estimated 100 experiences each. These responses combined equal 229 reports of presence. The respondents indicated that the source of their feelings was not their own imagination or internal voices. The conviction of the contact was strong. These emergency service workers, who were familiar with death and well-grounded in the physical world, were quite aware of the unusual character of these experiences, but were equally clear that they were real. Kelly also comments, The subjects were, perhaps, as far as one might imagine from being a group prone to superstition or hysteria. All offered their information freely and without coercion. They showed good psychological function before, during, and after the event had prior experiences with death, noted the presence as unusual, were not extremely religious, and accepted a spiritual explanation of the presence as plausible. They also suggest that attempts by NDEers and or dying individuals to communicate with those around them may be more successful than previously thought. So yeah, rather than living people having an NDE being completely unable to communicate with the living, the experiences of these emergency workers suggest that the deceased may be able to get into at least partial contact more than previously has been supposed. And incidentally, we discussed how individuals might be initially confused and alarmed by finding themselves dead, you know, back in episode 292 on distressing near-death experiences. For our purposes, though, the important thing to note is that a sizable percentage of emergency service workers reported what are basically ADCs, at-death scenes for people they didn't know and for whom they thus are not grieving, at least not more than having a slight sadness that they're trained to deal with. 
You've provided evidence that grief is not a good general explanation for ADCs, but what about other mental-emotional factors that could drive them? Could they simply be the result of religious or spiritual beliefs that the experiencers have, so that people who describe themselves as religious or spiritual end up imagining them for purely natural reasons? It's a reasonable question, but the data indicates that religion and spirituality are not the driving factors of the experiences. The international study, which included a lot of Europeans, found that only 9% of the respondents described themselves as religious before they had the after-death communication, and only 36% described themselves as spiritual before they had the ADC. So, in both cases, it was only a minority of people having ADCs that identified as religious or spiritual individuals. 91% did not identify as religious, and 64% did not identify as spiritual. I think this would be very different, or at least somewhat different, if you polled people from the Americas, but given the participants' recruitment methods, the survey seems to have included a very large number of Europeans, and Europe has a much more secular society than the Americas. But the point is that large majorities of those reporting ADCs did not identify as religious or spiritual, so it wasn't religious or spiritual beliefs that were driving the experiences. This is also borne out in the case studies. Here's an example from a woman named Deborah, whose brother Joseph died of cancer at age 44. I was a card-carrying skeptic before this experience. I'd had dreams about my brother. But this wasn't a dream. About three months after Joseph died, I was asleep in bed with my husband. I felt someone shaking my leg to wake me up. I looked over. There was Joseph sitting on the edge of the bed with his hand on my leg. He looked real, like any living person sitting there. He looked great. He radiated a warm, yellowish white light like an aura. He looked very calm and peaceful. He hugged me. I felt his hug. It felt wonderful and warm and loving, and I smelled his cologne, too. Joseph told me, I am all right, and you shouldn't be unhappy. Everything is all right. It is beautiful where I am. I talked to him with thoughts, and I told him I loved him. Then he just gradually faded away. I felt relief because I didn't have to worry anymore about my brother being all right. And here's another example from a woman named Tina, whose 47-year-old brother Rudy had died in an industrial accident. I was in the kitchen, doing my house cleaning. All of a sudden, our cat shot out of the family room. Her hair was standing on end and she was hissing. She was going so fast you couldn't get any traction on the linoleum floor. She was kind of running in place. At the same time, our little dog was backing out of the family room, barking and growling with his hair standing up. They prompted me to look, and when I did, I saw my brother, Rudy, sitting in the rocking chair. He was smiling at me. I was so happy to see him. He was sitting there in a pair of blue jeans and a red plaid shirt, just as he had done many, many times when he was living. I had a calm, reassuring feeling that Rudy was okay. Then he faded away before my eyes. I was a hard-nosed non-believer until I had this experience. I didn't think anything like this could ever happen. If it hadn't been for the reactions of the animals, I would have thought that my mind was playing tricks on me. So, both on a statistical basis and from case studies, it does not appear that religious or spiritual beliefs are what's driving these experiences. If it were, we'd expect high proportions of those who have ADCs to report being religious or spiritual before the event, and we have large majorities of people who do not identify in this way reporting such experiences. Are there other problems with the idea that ADCs are simply the product of people's imaginations, even if we can't just chalk them up to grief or religious and spiritual beliefs? Yes, there are at least two. Uh, The first is the fact that many ADCs have witnesses, sometimes multiple witnesses. And the second is that ADCs often contain veridical information. Then let's talk about both of those, starting with witnesses. Have we seen any examples of that so far? Yeah, we have. Uh, For example, last week we heard an account uh, involving the family of a woman named Sarah. Her son, Andrew, had been killed in a motorcycle accident, and before his memorial service, she, her husband, and their surviving son were having a family hug. And all three of them, 
felt the light pressure of Andrew joining the family hug. And Sarah also heard him, mentally heard him say, hey guys, it's okay. Now, this was not a dramatic incident. It was just a light hug. And you could propose that was due to imagination. But it's significant that three people felt it rather than just one, because it's comparatively easier to get one person to imagine that something is happening and to get multiple people to imagine the same thing happening at the same time is harder. So when there are multiple witnesses to an event, the odds that it's just due to imagination go down. And the more dramatic the event is, the more they go down with additional witnesses. So we'll look at a few such examples, culminating with one where I'll bring a special guest onto the program. For example, here is a notable case from a woman named Blair, whose father had died following a series of strokes. I was feeling very sorry for myself, very much alone in the world. I remember sitting in a chair in my hotel room, praying for my father the night before his funeral. There were two other people in the room, my son, who was five years old, and a friend who was there for moral support. As I was praying, the lights in the room seemed to grow dim, and all of a sudden, there was my father. He seemed very, very solid. Though he was in his 80s when he died, he now appeared to be more like a man in his 60s. There were colors radiating from him and surrounding him, a combination of bluish-white, rose, and gold. He stood there and told me, Be strong and take care of your mother. Remember, I love you. Goodbye. Dad's facial expression softened considerably when he said, Remember, I love you. It lasted only a few seconds, and then he left. My little boy, who was in bed, got up. I thought he had been asleep. He ran to me and said, My granddaddy, my granddaddy. And I said, Your granddaddy is gone. And he said, No, my granddaddy was right here. So my son saw him too. This is notable because Blair didn't say anything out loud during the experience. So she didn't do anything to prompt her son to start thinking about her father being in the room with them. It thus appears that the boy independently and unprompted saw the ADC of his grandfather at the same time his mother did. Here is an experience from, from a woman named Jenny. Uh, she had lost two sons. Thirteen years earlier, her son Philip had died at birth. And then three weeks earlier, her son Mike drowned. Three weeks after Mike's death, I was attending a baptism in church. All at once I felt a hand slide across my shoulders from the right to the left, and I heard the voice of my son speak to me. I'm here, Mom. I knew it was Mike, and I thought I had flipped out. About that same time, I felt a very firm hand on my left shoulder. Then a voice I had never heard before, slightly more mature than Mike's, said, We're both here, Mom. And I thought, Oh my goodness, I have completely gone overboard and I'm ready for the funny farm. I looked at my 14-year-old daughter, Mandy, sitting next to me, and she looked at me. She had tears running down her face. Mandy said, Mama, do you feel Mike? She said she didn't hear him or see him, but she felt his presence. This was my confirmation that I was not imagining it. Truly, both my sons had touched me and had spoken to me. I believe that with all my heart. In this case, we again have an independent witness who detected the ADC without prompting. While Jenny was having a tactile and audible ADC of both Mike and Philip, Jenny's daughter Mandy had a sentient ADC of her brother Mike. She did not detect Philip, which may make sense since the two didn't really know each other as Mandy was only one years old when Philip died at birth. Incidentally, this experience indicates something that is common in spontaneous experiences of apparitions, since the deceased are usually thought to be communicating telepathically and different people are thought to have different degrees of telepathic ability and openness, they may pick up on different aspects of what's going on, but they may not get the full picture. In this case, Mandy, without her mother saying anything, picked up on Mike's presence, whereas, whereas her mother had a fuller experience of what was happening. Now, here's an experience reported by a woman named Lois, whose husband died of a stroke at age 33. When my husband, Ray, passed away, our four sons were between 8 and 13. The three older boys knew that their father had not been well 
and understood what had happened. But our youngest, eight-year-old Jesse, was frightened and disoriented. Ray was always very compassionate with the boys and always talked to them about everything that happened. He went camping with them and discussed problems with them. He spent a lot of time with his sons. Two mornings after Ray died, I walked down the hall of our house. As I approached the master bedroom, I saw Jesse sitting on the side of the bed with his father. His dad had his arm around him and was talking to him. Ray looked natural like he normally did. He seemed to be calm and reassuring. Ray was aware that I was there too. He looked down and kind of smiled at me, then gestured for me to go back down the hall. So I went around the corner and waited for about 15 minutes. Jesse finally came out of the bedroom. Apparently, Ray had explained to him what had happened, and he seemed to feel a lot better. Jesse said, Daddy told me that he has gone and won't be coming back and not to worry about him. Everything will be all right. Jesse seemed much happier than he did before. The fact that this happened didn't surprise me very much. After that, our boy was able to accept his father's death and go on. So in this case, Lois's youngest boy, Jesse, was having an ADC of his father, Ray, in which Ray was explaining that he had died, but that it would be okay you know, to help Jesse come to terms with the situation. Lois stumbled into this situation as it was happening, and she and Ray acknowledged each other. Lois was not prompted by anything Jesse was doing to have this experience. She just stumbled into it while it was happening. And then Jesse came out and confirmed that the ex- confirmed the experience and what his father had said. Now, here's an experience where I happen to have the accounts of both witnesses so we can compare them. And the experience involves a young couple named Benjamin and Molly. Benjamin's mother had died a few days earlier of cancer, and then they had a shared ADC. Here's Benjamin's account of it. The day of my mother's funeral, my wife Molly and I visited my cousin and her husband at mother's house. We stayed well into the night, and then Molly and I got into the car. I put the key in the ignition, and as I did, I looked up. About ten yards away, I saw my mother standing in the doorway behind the clear glass storm door. She would always stand in the doorway out of kindness and courtesy to make sure we had gotten safely to the car. This was a common practice of hers. I'd seen it a thousand times. The inside door was open, so the light from the house was illuminating Mother from the back, and the porch light was illuminating her from the front. She appeared to be in good health and was very solid. She was there waving goodbye. She seemed relieved, less tired, less stressful. I got the definite impression that this was a don't worry type of message. Instantly, I had a tremendous physical feeling, almost like being pinned to the ground. It was like a wave came over me and went completely through me from head to toe. It seemed like an eternity, yet it seemed like a split second. I tried to speak, but I couldn't. At the same time, Molly said, Ben, I just saw your mother in the doorway. I bowed my head and said, So did I. And I began to cry. That was the first time I had shed any tears over my mother's death. I've never wept so hard in my entire life, and I felt a sense of relief, like, goodbye for now. And here's Molly's account. The night of his mother's funeral, my husband Ben and I went to her house and visited with his family. We were there quite late. As we got back in the car, I looked at the front door. I saw his mother standing in the open doorway, waving goodbye to us. She looked like she normally did. It was definitely her. She looked very peaceful, very healthy, and younger. In times past, when we would visit her, she always stood by that door and waved goodbye. So this was just like she had done many times before. I looked over to Ben and said, Did you? And he started crying real hard. I realized we had both seen his mother at the same time, but Ben wasn't able to speak. As soon as I looked over to him, she was gone. I think the reason I was allowed to see his mother was for confirmation for Ben so he would know she was not a figment of his imagination. In this case, both Ben and Molly had a visual ADC of Ben's mother at the same time and before either said anything to the other, so neither prompted the other. 
Then, just as Ben was about to say something, he got choked up, and Molly blurted out what she had just seen of the event. And Ben confirmed that he had seen the same thing and finally started crying about his mother's death. Now, as I promised, here's a special guest to tell us about an olfactory ADC that he experienced. The guest is someone I know. He's an instructor, colleague, and friend, and the experience itself has something like 25 independent witnesses. Lloyd Auerbach has a master's degree in parapsychology. He is the director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations and the president of the Forever Family Foundation and the Rhine Research Center. He has been working in parapsychology for over 40 years, focusing on education and field investigation. He is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books and teaches parapsychology courses online through the Rhine Education Center. In addition, he is a professional mentalist and psychic entertainer under the name Professor Paranormal, and he's also a professional chocolatier. His media appearances on television, radio, and in print number in the thousands, including The Unexplained, ESPN Sports Center, ABC's The View, Oprah, Larry King Live, and Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Lloyd Auerbach, welcome back <laughs> to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. Good to see you. Likewise. So we're talking today about Martin Caden, and not a lot of people may remember exactly who he is. So why don't you tell us a little bit about him first? Sure. Uh, Martin Caden was a science and science fiction writer, uh, aviation expert, and sometime consultant to NASA, as it happens, uh, about their own history, because he was so tied to it in some respects. The name may not sound familiar, but I'm sure people are familiar with some of the things that came out of his writings, including um, the Six Million Dollar Man TV series and The Bionic Woman. Uh, the Six Million Dollar Man was based on his novel Cyborg, and he was heavily involved in the Six Million Dollar Man show and actually in the development of The Bionic Woman as well. He also wrote a book called Marooned, which was an Academy Award winner in the 19, late 1960s and pretty much predicted the Apollo 13 incidents. So that, that was kind of an interesting uh, little psychic tie. Um, I met him in the mid 90s, actually early 90s, and he had, when I met him at an unexplained Fortean research conference, uh, my dad had actually known him 30 years before because my dad worked for NBC News at the time with the Mercury and Gemini space shots. And Marty was there um, working both for NASA and also for Metromedia TV at the same time. So um, I had kind of a little bit of family history when I met him. Um, but uh, I knew he had a little bit of interest in ghosts and such since he had written a book called Ghosts of the Air. Uh, and what was surprising was that he was able to do a little PK, a little mind over matter, and it wasn't so little. So I, worked, I got to know him very well after I met him in 92 with this conference visited him a number of times in uh, Florida at his homes when he lived in Gainesville. And then when he moved to co back to Cocoa beach um, and um, he became kind of a mentor to me in a lot of ways. And we did a lot of, we even did a couple of workshops together on PK. So um, he's prominently featured in my mind over matter book. In fact, tell me a little bit more about the uh, PK that he would do. I understand he used what are called side wheels to demonstrate some of that. Yeah. Um, he got the idea for this. This was not a new idea. I mean, the idea of paper or other types of material balanced um, like almost a tent on a pin or some kind of spindle. Um, I remember a movie in 1968 called The Power with George Hamilton and Michael Rennie, uh, where the characters had tried to move the little side wheel as well. They didn't call it that at that time. But he was given the idea, actually a challenge by another science fiction writer, G. Harry Stein, um, and uh, who felt that they had a group apparently that was um, trying to do PK in that way. And he had a book out on how to have the psi wheel in it and other kind of mind devices, mind machines you can build was the name of the book. And Harry and talking to, um, to Marty basically challenged him to try to move this thing because he knew Marty was a bullheaded guy. And actually, if folks um, knew Martin Caden, he was a very larger than life character uh, in many, many ways. In fact, I write two days before the conference, I happen to switch on the TV, talk about synchronicity, flipping channels, and I hear the name Martin Caden, stop, stop it on a, a show called Stunt Masters, 
and a segment where he was flying a reconstructed German bomber, the, uh, the JU Junkers bomber um, called Iron Annie. He became famous for rescuing that plane out of the South American jungles and refurbishing it. He had 19 people on the wing of the plane, setting a new world record for wing walking. Um, so that was kind of my introduction to him, more modern, beyond the $6 million man. Uh, so he, being bullheaded, spent weeks uh, staring at this little wheel, not getting it to move. And then one day, he, something just clicked in his head and it started turning and kept turning. And he was able to do it then under glass or... Uh, working with some of the NASA folks, they did it under more controlled conditions. Working with uh, someone at a local archery company, and actually an archery manufacturing company in Florida, which had an atmosphere chamber um, to test the kind of aerodynamics of arrowheads of some of their arrows. They, he was able to stand outside the chamber. They reduce it down to one one hundredth of an atmosphere with a remote controlled fan in the room, not turning the target when it was on because there was no air, not enough air, Marty was able to get a turn from outside. So he, he had a setup in his house in Gainesville, which he had built with a double pane glass and sealed. It was a completely sealed room uh, once the door was closed with weather stripping. And I actually set up all the targets of varying materials um, on a, sh a large shelf. And on my suggestion, he, I say, make him start, make him stop. We went away. We came back. They were not moving at all. I did the same thing multiple times. He was able to get them move, to move. So uh, pretty much was capable of doing this. But I found that he also had his own limitations, which related to his uh, aviation work. I mean, he he could not move a ping pong ball around across the table. And he felt it was because of friction and drag which are a couple of things you hear from pilots all the time. So this is something about CPK that's kind of interesting that people set their own limits. And I understand he was very enthusiastic as uh, in terms of airplanes. I read one quote from an obituary of his that someone who knew him said he didn't fly a plane, he wore it. Yeah, I think that that is the general feeling of so many people that I encountered through him. Um, he embodied aviation in so many different ways. I mean, he even kind of forced the Army Air Corps to to make him a pilot or teach him to fly back in the 1940s um, because of an article that he wrote at age 17 that was going to be published in Aviation Week. Um, it never actually physically hit the stands because the Department of Defense, Defense folks actually knew about or found out about it in time and they pulled all issues. So the article itself didn't exist. So there was written up later on, believe it or not, in a comic book in the fifties. And um, they went look, the FBI went looking for him because he had details about the Manhattan project, about the atomic bomb that no one else knew. And they pick up the 17 year old kid, take him to Washington. Um, couldn't believe that it was him. He convinced them, the FBI guys, that there wasn't another Martin Caden hiding in his apartment. Uh, and uh, he was sitting with a general who asked him where he got his information. And he was able to actually cite aviation and science articles, which allowed him to put it all together. So his uh, there, what he the way he described it to me was like with kind of a smirk, knowing that the general was kind of half kidding. What do we do for you? Do with you? Do we um, put you in prison for the rest of the war? Do we kill you, <laughs> or what? And Marty just said, "No, you you put me in a plane. I want to learn how to fly." He was seventeen. He was not allowed to join the army during World War II. He's too young. They made an exception, and he learned to fly that way. Cool. Now on. Um you knew him in the 90s, and on March 24th, 1997, he died of cancer. And reportedly, nine days later, which would be about April 2nd, you had an unusual experience. Tell us about that. Well, first, I should say that he had, um, when he was diagnosed with cancer, <clears throat> it was thyroid cancer, which is, which is fairly treatable, but he had been misdiagnosed by his doctor months before. So by the time he was diagnosed, it spread throughout his body. Um, he was given eight weeks to live by the Mayo Clinic. He actually called me from the Mayo Clinic, he and his wife, 
And I asked him flat out, what did you tell them? And he, he gave, he quoted, he said something which I cannot repeat here as to what he told the doctors to do. Let's put it that way. Um, he lived over a year and a half longer. And apparently every week, what he, what his wife told me was every week after that eight weeks, he called the doctors to yell at them. Um, he was very bullheaded. Now, in all that time, he also said, when I go hour back, I'm going to haunt you. And I said, okay, bring it on, <laughs> you know, uh, that'd be great. So I got the news on March 24th from his wife that he passed in hospice. Um, I had promised to him that I do, I think I do, I think it was three shots of rum <laughs> in his honor. And I did that. Uh, and, you know, people who talk about suggestion that you, you expected to see him. Well, I expected to see him or have something happen. Now, the majority of, of post-death experiences, the people who know the individual who died, happen at the moment of death or within a couple of days. It's really rare to go more than a week. So a week passes for me. Nothing happens. <clears throat> As you said, nine days later, I was driving on the weekday to uh, very early in the morning to the Oakland airport to fly up to Portland for work. Um, it was a, it was just maybe a minute after seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, and I was driving through uh, Oakland on one of the freeways. It was an unusually light traffic morning for 7 a.m., which was good for me. Um, and all of a sudden, my car, which I have to say was less than three months old, still smelled somewhat new. My car filled up with the smell of cig stinky cigar smoke. And it was identifiably the kind of cigar smoke that I smelled when I was around Marty and what he smoked. So I also felt a presence in the seat next to me, like there was somebody seated in the passenger seat. There was nobody there. Um, I recognized immediately it had to be him or his presence. So I, I said my goodbyes, basically. And then it went away. Um, I flew up to Portland. And the first thing I did before I even left the airport was I went to a payphone, if folks remember those. And I called a friend of Marty's named Bob Button in New Jersey, who was another pilot. He was a friend of Marty's who often came down to Florida to visit Marty. And so I got to know him fairly well. And as Bob picks up the phone, I said, Bob, it's Lloyd Auerbach. He says, Lloyd, you must be psychic. I said, of course I am, Bob. And because that's what you say. And uh, he, I said, why do you say that? He didn't even ask me why I was calling at this point. He just went on and said he was flying his Cessna at a little after 10 uh, in the New Jersey area. He was alone in the cockpit. And at 10, 10, his cockpit filled up with the smoke of stinky cigar smoke, the smell of stinky cigar smoke, and he sensed a presence in the other seat. And he felt it was Marty. So he did what I did. He said his goodbyes. And then when he landed, um, a while later, he called a friend of theirs down in Florida, another pilot, actually a test pilot friend of Marty's. And it turned out that the other guy had had an experience at 1020 in Florida. So now mine happens at 7 a.m. Pacific time, 10, 10 Eastern time, which is 7, 10 Pacific time, 10, 20, 7, 20. So when, he, when Bob finished this, he asked me why I was calling at this point. I explained to him what happened and when it happened. I said, hey, Bob, it's been a week and a half, almost a week and a half. Why did it take so long to him, for him to get to us? And he basically said, well, you knew Caden. He, he knew a lot of people around the world. We must not have been high up on the list. So a few weeks later, I get a call from Bob telling me that he asked around to other pilot friends of theirs. And if they were alone in a car, and only when they were alone in a car or in a plane, in one of their own planes, they had that similar experience before and after the, the time of our experience. Um, it was somewhere around, I think it was 25 of us all together. Is, and then I think Bob stopped. I mean, he could have kept calling other people. There might have been a lot of other folks too. But that was pretty, that very, very consistent experience for people is a really interesting one. Now, I think I remember hearing you say once that it seems like, at least with some apparitions, with some ghosts, that it takes them a while to figure out how to use PK psychokinesis to affect objects in the world. It's not something they immediately know how to do upon dying. Do you think that um, Martin Caden's PK abilities that he had in life helped him manifest more quickly in this way to people like he was generating the cigar smell physically, or do you think it was more of a telepathic experience or what would your view be? Well, considering the fact that 
not all apparitional experiences, even at the moment of death or right after, are visual. They are often olfactory or just a sense of presence. Um, they can be just a voice. So it's how we perceive the signal, more or less. How are we perceiving as an individual the ghost? Marty might have focused, wouldn't have been PK, he might have focused on the, the cigar smoke because that was identifiable for those of us who knew him. So that was kind of the signal, other than appearing to, to people, which frankly, I think as a pilot, he would have known might have been pretty jarring for somebody driving or flying a plane alone. Um, although that did happen to him in an experience at one point in his past when he was alive. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things that is more about intention, but not a physical and not a, something that manifests physical. So you might say that all apparition experiences are telepathic. We're getting a bit of information from the person who has died from that that consciousness and we process it either in a way that they intend because that's what they're focusing on or generally for most apparitions because they don't even know to do that uh i don't know how anybody would even think to do that normally generally it's just whatever their you know their self-image what they think of themselves how they think of themselves is picked up by those of us that are alive and processed the way we would normally process that information I understand that you've written about uh, this experience. Where can people read about that? Well, as it happens today, which is uh, Friday, um, the 19th of January, Amazon just put up my second edition uh, in paperback of this book, a paranormal case book. It's the new cover. This is the proof copy. I haven't gotten an actual copy of it yet. Um, so... Um, it is available in paperback now. It will be, it should be available. I'm going to work on it over the next week to make sure it gets in shape for Kindle. So it should be available for Kindle, um, sometime around the, uh, 27th of somewhere around the 27th, 28th of January as well. They usually put that up pretty quickly once the, once everything's reformatted for that. So, so by, uh, by the time this airs, they'll, they should both be available. I would think so. Yeah. By the time this airs, it should be available. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you'd like to cover? Well, uh, just that we have some new classes coming up at the Ryan Center, and uh, the one, the two that are, two that I'm te teaching immediately. One is our field investigations class, so if people are interested in ghosts and poltergeists and how we really investigate, not what's on TV. That's a good course to take. Um, that's the first. They're both starting the first week of February. Uh, the other class is dreams and altered states of consciousness and how it ties into psychic experience. And um, those are both eight-week classes from the Rhine Education Center. And then in March, I'll be teaching a class looking at the technology that is uh, used for understanding the environment in ghost hunting and investigations, but also kind of taking a look at the ghost hunting devices that we see all over the place from those groups and for the TV shows. And because of the lag time uh, before uh, things like this air on Mysterious World, those will already be in progress or possibly completed. But you teach regularly for the Rhine. And I know you teach those courses like field investigations and so forth regularly. So people will have an opportunity to take them. Yeah, generally once a year for the, for most of those courses that are there. Yeah. OK, well, Lloyd Auerbach, thank you so much for joining us on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Thank you, Jimmy. So this is a particularly compelling olfactory and sentient experience. Uh, Caden had told Lloyd, I'm going to haunt you our back. And he did. Uh, for people who knew Martin Caden, both smelled his cigar smoke and sensed his presence when they were alone. And when Lloyd called Martin's friend, the friend blurted out his own experience of the ADC before Lloyd mentioned his. They had both had the same experience, and the friend eventually tracked down around 25 of Martin's other friends who, reported, who all reported similar experiences, and then he stopped searching for them, which is understandable as 25 independent witnesses involving this kind of experience from Martin Caden is quite impressive. And this illustrates how, in some cases, very large numbers of independent witnesses may be involved in ADCs, which suggests that they're not simply products of the imagination, as you would not expect 25 witnesses to imagine the same thing. Now, before we continue on with our analysis, I'd like to take a moment here to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Richard S., 
Linda K, Jolie G, Sean K, and Michael C. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and buy Rosary Army, featuring award winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at RosaryArmy.com and SchoolOfMary.com. Jimmy, you also mentioned that another problem with the imagination theory is that some ADCs include veridical information. Not everybody may be familiar with that term. What is veridical information and what are some ADCs that include it? The basic meaning of the term veridical is truthful or coinciding with reality. So fundamentally, veridical information is true information. But in a parapsychological context, it has a couple of special nuances. In particular, it means information that emerged from a parapsychological situation that the experiencers did not previously know, and it's information that is specific enough that it could not have been guessed by random chance. So the idea is something paranormal happens, people learn something from that experience that they didn't previously know, and that something is too specific to be guessed by random chance, and then that thing turns out to be true. When vertical knowledge like that is obtained, it provides evidence that the event producing this knowledge was genuinely paranormal, because there aren't good natural explanations. The people involved didn't previously know the info, and random chance guessing wouldn't explain it. So it looks like they got the information from a paranormal source. Vertical information thus provides evidence that something genuinely paranormal is happening. In the case of after-death communications, if the experience get information they didn't previously know, and it's too specific to be randomly guessed, and it turns out to be true, then that provides evidence for something genuinely paranormal happening in the ADC. Vertical information does sometimes come through in ADCs. The international study asked about this. They asked the respondents if they had received any information that was unknown to them, and 24%, so basically one in four, said yes. The booklet about the study gave the following examples of the kinds of things that people reported learning. My son told us how he had passed. A prediction of a future event that I was not expecting to see happened as there was nothing to logically indicate my dad would die that year. Lots of the information was unknown to me, such as how my brother died. She said that my son had something to celebrate. I later learned that he had secretly gotten married. How she came to be hit, that she was aware of what had been going on since she left. The location of items that I would not have known. My sister's pregnancy. A dangerous event was going to happen that would have caused significant injury. The Guggenheims report that vertical information particularly comes through when the loved one has died under mysterious circumstances, like if they committed suicide, or if they killed themselves by accident, or if they were murdered. In these cases, the loved one may give information about how they died, and the experiencer didn't previously know this. For example, here's an account from a man named Greg whose friend Evan had been electrocuted in an industrial accident at a construction site at age 20. Evan and I were best friends for nine years. We did everything together, except when we were at school or working or started going out with girls. Two nights after Evan died, I had a dream. I was where the road splits to go to my house and to his house. We were standing and facing each other and everything was lifelike. We were really excited about seeing one another. Evan was so happy and cheerful. He appeared the same as always and in good health. He had a great big smile on his face. I asked him, what happened? He said, I was up putting a light fixture on a 20-foot pole when I hit some electrical wires. Something happened and I started to fall. He put one hand vertically and one hand horizontally to show me how he fell. 
Evans said he felt scared at that moment, and then he felt nothing else. He said, I promise, I didn't mean for that to happen. He also wanted to assure me that he suffered none whatsoever through that experience. He told me he didn't want any of us worrying about him or being extremely sad that he was gone because he was in a great place. He was well taken care of and very happy, waiting for us to join him someday. Then I woke up. I never had a dream like that before. It was very special to me that I was able to communicate with Evan after he died. It was like we parted with the realization that we will be back together someday. In this experience, Evan told Greg a lot of stuff about he died that Greg didn't previously know and that you couldn't just guess. However, as far as I can tell, this is just an experience report, and I don't have evidence that they did any follow-up to confirm the details of how Evan died. Uh, that investigation would involve things like talking to witnesses at the construction site or the medical examiner, but this wasn't a full investigation, so I wouldn't cite this as definite evidence. However, many experiencers of ADCs do have confirmation of the information they learned, and for some of them, that serves as confirmation of the paranormality of the experience. We've already heard of a number of cases like this. For example, we heard about Melinda's case, where after 10 years of not being in contact with her friend Tom, he suddenly shows up and says goodbye wearing a Navy uniform, and just after this, she learns that he had just died and that he had become a Navy chaplain. So she got confirmation both of his death and why he was wearing the Navy uniform. And after 10 years of no contact, those items are, of vertical information are quite compelling. Basically, all of the cases where someone had an ADC when they didn't know the person was dead potentially fall into this category. There are multiple cases where someone doesn't know the person is dead, they have an ADC, and then they get confirmation of the death, like the case of Warren, who we heard about earlier this episode. He got up at 4.30 in the morning and started swimming his laps. He had an ADC of his father, and then he was told that his father had died at 3.44 in the morning shortly before he woke up. Sometimes people get confirmation that the death occurred at the same time the ADC did, like in the case of the grief, grief counselor Edith we heard about. Uh, she had an ADC of her patient Howard at 423, and then he, she got confirmation that he had died at 423. Now, in Edith's case, she knew that Howard was in the process of dying, but in many cases, the experiencer doesn't have any idea that the patient is about to die, or even that they're sick or in a dangerous situation, like Melinda, not having heard from her friend Tom in 10 years. And in cases like that, the evidential force of the vertical information is even stronger. There also are cases where some really specific vertical information comes out, much more specific than the fact that someone is dead or the time that they died. For example, here's a case of from a man named Emery, whose foster father had died of cancer. And it involves the saying of the Jewish prayer known as the mourner's Kaddish, which incidentally is evidence for Jewish belief in purgatory that predates Christianity. Emery says, There is a tradition in the Jewish faith of saying the Kaddish on the anniversary of a person's death. It was a prayer recited by mourners after the death of a close relative. Since my foster father didn't leave any children behind of his own flesh and blood, I had it taken upon myself to say the Kaddish for him every year. Not being Jewish, I'm not part of a synagogue. However, I can go on the anniversary of Dad's death and say the prayer. This particular time, my wife and a friend went with me. On the way down from the sanctuary, we all smelled pipe tobacco in the elevator. It smelled like an apple pie out cooling on a windowsill. Later, I asked my foster mom about it. I knew that dad had given up smoking cigarettes, but I didn't know that he had become a pipe smoker before he died. When she told me that his tobacco smelled like apple pie, I was about ready to pick my jaw up off the floor. So in this case, we have three witnesses to the smell of apple pipe tobacco, making it harder to dismiss this as just imagination. And we also have vertical info on two points that Emery didn't previously know, that his foster father had become a pipe smoker 
and that the tobacco he preferred smelled like apple pie. Now, here's an experience from a woman named Faith. Uh, She's a psychologist who works with terminally ill children, and her 13-year-old patient, Susie, had died of leukemia two weeks earlier. I was in a meditation circle, and all of a sudden, Susie appeared to me in a vision. She said, call my mother and tell her not to worry about my quilt. She was very happy, very cheerful, and there was a lot of light around her face and head. I knew if I called, I'd get caught up in a long conversation. Secondly, what was this about a quilt? So again, the child appeared to me and said, Call my mother about the quilt. The next day, I phoned Susie's mother. She told me, I'm so glad you called because yesterday was the worst day I've had since Susie died. I was so upset that I got Susie's quilt and went outside. I lay down under the tree and just cried and cried. I said, Wait, I need to tell you something. Yesterday at a prayer group, Susie appeared to me and asked me to tell you, It's okay about my quilt. Does this mean anything to you? Susie's mother burst out crying and said, You won't believe this, but when I was lying under the tree crying, I was upset because Susie had had this quilt since, ever since she was a baby. She took it with her everywhere, every place, and nev- was never separated from it. When we buried her, I couldn't bear to part with her quilt. I felt so guilty about keeping it. You don't know how good it makes me feel to hear this. I'm so glad you called. So here, Faith got a very specific message. Tell my mom not to worry about Susie's quilt. So Susie had a quilt. For some reason, her mother was worried about it, but she didn't need to be. And all those things turned out to be true. Susie did have a quilt, one that she had been very attached to since childhood. Her mom was worrying about it because she was feeling guilty for not putting it in Susie's coffin. But Susie assured her mom that she didn't need to worry about this, which took a huge load off her mind. There's no way Faith could have guessed all that by random chance, so this looks genuinely paranormal. And if I may say so, I totally sympathize with the mother in this case. I can easily imagine being in that situation and not being able to give up the quilt either. Now, here is a story that is very interesting. It deals with an ADC that happened to a woman named Ruth. Her 18-year-old grandson, Thomas, had died 11 months earlier in an automobile accident. One day, my daughter Sally said, Mother, I don't want anything for my birthday. Please don't do anything for me. All I want is Thomas, and I can't have him. At 7.45 on the morning of her birthday, I thought I would ride down to Sally's office and at least give her a card. Within blocks of her office, I heard Thomas's voice say in my head, Grandma, would you please get my mother a red rose for her birthday? I said, Oh, Tommy. Then I started to cry and said, Of course I'll get her a rose. And he said, And tell Mom I love her. So I went to a flower shop, but it wouldn't be open until 9 o'clock. I went to another one, then another, and another. None of them were open yet. It was 8.15, and Thomas spoke again. Please, Grandma, get me the red rose from my mother. I started driving south. He said, Turn the cow around. Go north. I did, and within ten blocks, I came to a sign, Florist. This was one I didn't even know about, because it was off the main road. By this time, it was 8.25, and there was a lady putting a key in the door, even though the shop wasn't supposed to open until nine o'clock. The front door had a big sign on it, Special, Red Roses, $1 each. I bought the red rose, and then Thomas was gone. I walked into Sally's office and handed her the rose. I had written Thomas on the card. She looked at me, and we both cried. I said, Thomas asked me to do it. He even showed me where to buy it. My daughter was just thrilled. In this case, Thomas guided his grandmother to a location where she could buy the red rose even though none of the flower shops were open and the one he guided her to wasn't open either, but someone was there who could sell her the rose. This is an example of how ADCs can contain useful information that turns out to be correct. A similar experience was reported by a man named Sam, whose wife Grace died of an aneurysm. I have been contacted by my wife Grace many times. I've had long conversations with her. I ask her questions, and her words come into my head. For example, I was standing by the stove one day and felt her right beside me. I asked her, do you have any advice? And she said, clean up the house now. It was like an order. So I said, 
Okay, I will. I started picking things up, and just as I got through, the doorbell rang. Three of her Delta Kappa Gamma sorority sisters came to visit me. One was the president of the whole outfit. I know very well that Grace knew they were coming and gave me that warning. I was amazed when this happened. In this case, the information from the ADC was that the house needed to be cleaned up right now, and that turned out to be true in light of the unknown imminent visit of the sorority sisters. In this case, Sam's wife Grace seemed to know about something that was about to happen. Uh, that could have been because the sorority sisters were already planning their visit and uh, may have even begun getting ready for it or were on their way over and Grace was aware of all that. Another account is given by a woman named Anita, whose grandfather died of heart failure at age 87. This happened the day of my grandfather's funeral. I was lying in bed that evening when all of a sudden I felt his presence. I opened my eyes and my grandfather was standing beside me. He looked opaque, not like a solid person. He looked very healthy and had a glow about him, like a shining golden light was coming from his body. He bent down toward my head as though he were going to tell me a secret. He said, I will be a great grandfather in the spring. I will have a great grandson. Grandpa was born in Hungary and had a very strong accent. I had an overwhelming feeling of comfort and warmth and then he was gone. I got up immediately and went into the living room to tell my husband what had just happened. The next day, I had a pregnancy test, and I was indeed pregnant. When our son Tyler was born the following May, I kept saying, Grandpa, you were right. In this case, Anita's grandfather was aware that she was pregnant, even though she didn't know that yet, and he knew that it would be a baby boy. This makes this experience not only an after-death communication, but also an announcing dream. We talked about announcing dreams back in episode 282, so you can go to mysterious.fm slash 282 and listen to that one for more information. And just like Anita's grandfather diagnosed her pregnancy, ADCs also can diagnose other medical conditions. Here's an account from a woman named Martha, whose husband was an ophthalmologist, an eye expert who deals with vision care, and he had died of cancer at age 56. About two years after Alan's death, I was having severe headaches almost daily, which was very unusual for me. I wasn't sick. I just had frequent headaches. One day, I was sitting on the sofa reading. Very clearly, I mentally sensed Alan's voice saying, No wonder you have headaches. Your glasses are crooked. Go see Dan King and have them straightened. Dan King is a very good and competent optician and a personal friend. The next day, I went to his office and told him about my headaches. He looked at me and said that one lens was higher than the other because the frame was bent. He straightened my glasses and my headaches cleared up. I was relieved that Alan had an answer to my problem. This experience is not as dramatic, but it belongs to the same category as one experience we discussed back in episode 268 on Mysterious Voices. In that episode, a woman in Britain began having auditory ADCs from two former hospital workers that she didn't know. They diagnosed her as having a brain tumor and an inflamed brain stem, and they insisted that she get medical treatment. She thought that she was going crazy and went to a psychiatrist. But the brain tumor and inflammation diagnosis turned out to be correct, and she got the treatment she needed. You can go to mysterious.fm slash 268 to learn more about that case. Sometimes the vertical information takes the form of a very urgent warning. Here's an example from a woman named Glenda Lee, whose father had died 15 years earlier from a heart attack. I was driving down the highway in my truck. There was a railroad track on my right and side streets coming onto the highway on my left. As I was approaching the city limits, I heard someone say, Stop the truck! It startled me, but I didn't stop. A moment later, someone said again, Glendalee, stop the truck. Then I knew it was Daddy, and it scared me. It was like he was sitting right there next to me. Then he used a name he had called me all my life. He said, Baby, stop. And I slammed on the brakes. As I did, a car came out of the side street on my left. It shot straight across in front of me. Then it skidded into the dirt by the railroad track and stopped. It was a very scary feeling. The car had gone completely out of control. It couldn't have missed me by more than two inches. If my father hadn't told me to stop, 
it would have hit the driver's side of my truck, and I would have been killed. Another experience in which a life was saved because of an urgent warning in an ADC is reported by a woman named Debbie. It happened a week after her mother had died of cancer. I was staying in Virginia with my best friend Donna, who had a six-month-old daughter named Chelsea. Donna had put her daughter down for a nap, and I was going to run to the store to pick up some groceries. When I started to walk out the front door, telepathically I heard my mother's voice very distinctly say, You need to check on the baby. I told myself I must be grieving and just blew it off. As I started to walk out the door again, I heard my mother repeat, You need to check the baby. Her voice was crisp and clear. I turned around and walked back to Chelsea's bedroom and opened the door. I almost fainted. The baby was starting to turn blue. Somehow, she was all wrapped up in the blanket that had been covering her and in another blanket she had pulled off the side of the crib. I picked Chelsea up and thought I was going to have to do rescue breathing, but she just took a big gasp and let out a blood-curdling scream. I remember sitting down on the floor with her and crying, saying, My God, thank you, Mom. So there are multiple experiences, about one in four according to the International Survey, where the experiencer receives knowledge they didn't previously have, and sometimes that even saves lives, and it provides evidence that something paranormal is happening in these cases. That doesn't prove that there were actual communications with departed spirits, though. You also said that something called living agent Psy could be responsible. What is that, and how does it work? Living agent Psy is a concept from parapsychology. The idea is that a living person uses psychic abilities such as ESP or psychokinesis to accomplish something, but it gets mistakenly attributed to a non-living person. Like in many poltergeist cases, which we talked about in episode 195 on poltergeists and in other episodes. Historically, it's been assumed that a non-living spirit was responsible for poltergeist phenomena. In fact, that's what the word poltergeist means in German, noisy ghost. But today, many parapsychologists believe that many poltergeists, not all of them, are actually caused by a living person. This person is typically under stress, but they don't feel like they can act out their stress openly. So their subconscious externalizes their feelings by throwing a psychokinetic tantrum and things start moving. The idea in after-death communications would be that if living agent Psy is responsible, that the experiencers aren't really communicating with the spirits of their loved ones. And whenever veridical information comes through, it's really the living experiencer who's picking up on that information psychically and then weaving it into a fantasy misperception of communicating with their loved one. So, for example, maybe Sam subconsciously used his ESP to detect that Grace's Kappa Delta Gamma sorority sisters were on their way over, and then he knitted this into a fantasy ADC of Grace telling him to pick up the house right now. What do you think of Living Ancient Psy as an explanation for ADCs? I can't rule it 100% out, and, you know, this is a classic problem in parapsychology. It's often possible to generate evidence that something psychic is happening, but it's much harder to tell whose psi is responsible. As a result, no matter how much evidence of non-imaginary spirit communication gets produced, some parapsychologists wonder whether living agent psi could be responsible instead of departed spirits. Consequently, I can't rule out that living agent psi might be responsible for some veridical information in ADCs, but I don't like it as a good overall explanation. Why not? Because I take as a fundamental principle what is sometimes known in philosophy as phenomenal conservatism. Phenomenal conservatism involves taking experiences as representing what they seem to be until you get evidence that they should be taken in some other way. We all act on this principle, and it's key to being a rational, sane person. If you don't act on this principle, if you just assume that your experiences are something other than what they appear to be without any evidence for that, then you're acting in a paranoid manner. For example, if you come home and a woman who appears to be your wife serves you what appears to be an ordinary dinner, then 
That's how you ought to take the experience unless you get evidence otherwise. It's your wife serving you an ordinary dinner. It would be irrational and paranoid and contrary to the evidence you have to just assume that it's not your wife at all. It's her evil twin who you've never had any evidence exists and that it's not an ordinary dinner, but a poisoned one so that the evil twin can get your life insurance money. Assuming those things without evidence is just nuts, and it would be irrational, crazy, and paranoid. So I'm convinced that we should take experiences as they present themselves until we have evidence that they should be taken another way. And we should do this consistently and not let ourselves get distracted by hypothetical alternatives for which we have no evidence. Consequently, I don't like the living agent psi proposal as a general explanation for ADCs. These experiences present themselves as what they're named, after-death communications. I have no evidence that they are actually cases of living agent psi being knitted into imaginary conversations with deceased loved ones. So if someone has an ADC with witnesses and vertical information to back it up, I'm going to treat it as a very good evidential case of communicating with one's loved ones. I'm not going to tell the people, uh, actually, one of you just subconsciously and without intending to used ESP to pick up on the vertical information you got, and then you knitted it into a collective hallucination that you all had of your loved one. You know, without evidence, it's not logical for me to propose that. So I think that without further evidence, ADCs should be taken as what they appear to be. Then let's shift over to the faith perspective. We've covered the paranormal options that could explain after-death communications, but what about the supernatural ones that you mentioned? Could a spirit with a nature above human, like God, an angel, or a demon, be involved? Well, in principle, sure. Uh, for all I know, God may play a role in facilitating ADCs, and angels actually appear on camera in some of them. Like last episode, we heard an account uh, from a woman named Betsy who had been in a car crash where her two sons died, and afterward she was very distraught, as you can imagine, and an angel appeared and took her to a realm in the afterlife where she could see that her sons were happy and well. So angels may also play a role, and sometimes they play an explicit one. When it comes to demons, I can't rule these out. Uh, demons do impersonate spirits and try to trick people. That's why John. Uh, 1 John 4 tells us to test the spirits. But testing them is one thing, and just assuming that something is demonic without testing is another. That would be a paranoid refusal to apply the biblical principle of testing. So I don't think that we can propose that a demon is responsible for an ADC unless we have evidence that this is the case. If, in an ADC, an apparent loved one tells you something that's inconsistent with the faith, like, hey, son, you know, you really ought to start worshiping Baal, or, hey, son, you really ought to commit adultery with that neighbor lady, you know, uh, then I'm happy to say that this is a malicious, deceptive spirit, likely a demon, who is impersonating your loved one. But without such evidence, it would be paranoid to propose demons, and frankly, it would be ungrateful to do so. Why do you say that? Because the, the Christian faith acknowledges that God can let people have communications with him, with the good angels, and with the saints. Uh, we refer to these as visions and apparitions, among other terms, and they're gifts from God. Yes, there are some Christians who believe that these are not for our present age. That's a minority position within Christianity. And the vast majority of Christians acknowledge that these communications are, are real and for our day. The arguments that they're not are, for today, are frankly terrible, and they rely on implausible forced interpretations of biblical passages, but we can talk about that another time. The result is that even many in the Protestant community are open to such experiences, and with 40 to 50 percent of the population reporting ADCs, well, that's very significant evidence that these experiences are for today. And ADCs are basically just apparitions of people we know. Instead of having an apparition of a major saint like Jesus or Mary, 
these are apparitions of people we personally know and love, who typically show up to tell us that they love us, that they're happy and okay in the afterlife, and perhaps give us some additional information or finish some unfinished business with us. All those things are gifts. And just like it would be ungrateful to automatically dismiss an apparition of Jesus or Mary as the devil, it would be ungrateful to dismiss apparitions of our loved ones as demons, uh, especially when they're doing something unusual, either by God's power or their own, to get in communication with us and give us messages of love and hope. So, yes, it's possible that demons are responsible for some ADCs, but you need evidence to propose that in particular cases. And it's both paranoid and ungrateful to leap to the demon hypothesis without evidence. You've spoken thus far in terms of apparitions of the saints, which means spirits that are in heaven. But some of the cases we heard about last week suggested souls that were still being purified, that is, in purgatory. And one involved a case where it sounded like the soul might be damned. How does that square with what you've just said? Well, the historic Christian view is that souls that are being purified can also appear to us. There's nothing in the faith that says that can't happen, and there are loads of historical reports of that. Uh, in fact, there that's the classic explanation of what's responsible for reports of ghosts, uh, that there are souls in purgatory that are working out their purification in some way in, a, in connection with a location on earth, or appearing to the living in order to work out unfinished business with the living who they may have harmed or to ask for prayers from the living. And we heard examples of that last week, both in situations where people returned in an ADC to ask forgiveness for things they'd done in life or to openly ask for their living loved ones to pray for them. So that's evidence that not only can souls that are being purified appear to us, but souls that souls that are being purified do appear to us, which happens to be the historic view. What about the experience we discussed that might involve a genuinely damned soul? That involved a woman named Marlene, whose boyfriend Wes has committed suicide, and then he appeared to her in an unhappy state, saying that he had been sentenced to eternal life. That's consistent with him experiencing everlasting life without love, which would be hell. But it doesn't prove that that's what he is he was experiencing. Assuming that this was an authentic ADC, we still only have Marlene's perception of it. And perceptions and descriptions of apparitions by the living aren't perfect. So it could be that Wes just needed some purification and then could go to heaven. However, I wouldn't rule out the idea that the damned can appear to us. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was of the opinion that, by God's permission, even the damned can appear to the living. Well, you know, God's omnipotent and can do whatever he chooses, and there's nothing in the Bible that says God won't sometimes choose to let the damned appear. And there are multiple accounts in history of spirits that claim to be damned souls, like Judas or Nero, appearing to the living, including in exorcism cases. I've both read about that and been told about it by people in the exorcistic community. So I can't rule out that that's that this is what was happening in this case. Such encounters seem to be uncommon, but I'd say that it's an empirical question of whether God allows this or not, and there's at least a little bit of evidence that he does on occasion allow the damned to communicate with the living. One more question from the faith perspective. Last week, you cited a statement from the booklet on the international study that dealt with what the authors called releasing messages in ADCs. They said that releasing messages were things like, don't be sad, pursue your life, don't hold me back by your suffering. Don't be sad and pursue your life can be understood as messages where the loved one is releasing the living person to move on with life. But don't hold me back by your suffering sounds like a request asking the living to release the loved one to move on in the afterlife. How does that fit with the Christian faith? Well, this isn't an area that's been thoroughly explored, and I haven't seen a lot of discussion on this topic from a theological perspective. However, it doesn't contradict any teaching of the faith to propose that the living can have an effect on the progress that the departed are making in the afterlife. In fact, we have evidence that they can have such an effect. That's why we, 
like our Jewish brethren, pray for our lost loved ones so that God will help them with their progress in some way. There's also a passage in the Sermon on the Mount where it sounds to me like Jesus is alluding to an aspect of this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, Jesus is stressing the need for people to reconcile with each other, and he says, Settle the case quickly with your accuser while you are with him on the way, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never come out of there until you have paid back the last penny. Now, you could interpret this as just a this-worldly practical exhortation, you know, get reconciled with your enemies, or there may be legal consequences for you in civil court. But Jesus usually isn't in the business of giving legal advice about civil courts. He usually uses this-worldly examples to teach principles about the next world, with God taking the place of earthly judges in his parables. I've even read Protestant authors commenting on the fact that here it seems unlikely that Jesus is just giving legal advice, and it's more likely that he's giving advice about when we stand before God as our judge. Well, if he's doing that, then he suggests that people who have something against us can have an effect on how long we stay in spiritual prison. He doesn't say that if our accuser doesn't forgive us, we'll never get out of prison. He says that if our accuser doesn't forgive us, we won't get out until we've paid the last penny. So that suggests that we can get out of spiritual prison someday, and it suggests that we can avoid the spiritual prison if we can get our accuser, the person we have wronged, to forgive us. So I've always viewed this text, even back when I was Protestant, as suggesting that we can have an effect on the progress of those who have wronged us. If we say to God, this person has wronged me and I want justice, I want you to punish him fully for the wrong he did to me, well, then God will do that. He may forgive the person of the eternal wrong that the person committed against God, so they will go to heaven, but God has promised to defend the innocent, the widow, and the orphan, and he's promised to hear their cries for justice, so if I'm innocent and someone has wronged me, I can demand that God treat them justly for the finite offense they committed against me. And since it's only a finite offense, it won't involve an everlasting sentence. However, if I say to God, I've been reconciled with this person who wronged me, so please be merciful to him, then God will do that too and be merciful to him. Furthermore, since Jesus says that we need to be merciful to others if we want God to be merciful to us, I also make a point of releasing people from what they've done against me, particularly when I hear that the person has died, because I want God to be merciful to me when I stand before him. So I ask him to release those who have wronged me from what they did against me. Another way of looking at this is that, you know, the souls that are asking to be released by the living are not yet in the full glory of heaven, so they're still being purified. As a result, they don't yet have the full, unmixed joy of heaven. And so, they can look down and see us suffering, and that could make them sad. But if we move on with our lives, then we won't be sad when they see us, and it will help them make progress towards full joy. I thus think that it's quite possible for the living to have an effect on the progress that our departed loved ones are making, by our prayers for them, by our forgiving them for things they did to us, and by moving on and not permanently staying in grief so that they don't have a cause to be sad because of our suffering. Let's now shift back to the reason perspective to cover a few last questions. First, how do most people react to having an ADC? Do they find it helpful? Well, there's no one-size-fits-all response to having an ADC. As we heard last episode, some people are unprepared for them and may actually freak out and start screaming when an ADC happens. Also, some people have been really hurt in life, and they may not be prepared to forgive if a loved one shows up and asks for forgiveness for mistreating them when they were alive. They might say, you really hurt me. I'm not ready to forgive you. They might even say, burn in hell for all I care. So not everybody is going to have the same positive reaction to an ADC. However, 
the great majority of people do find them very helpful, particularly if they're grieving. The international study asked what people's reactions were after having an ADC. One question they asked was whether the ADC gave them comfort and emotional healing. 73%, so basically three quarters, says yes, it did give them comfort. 10% said no, it did not give them comfort. 8% were unsure, and another 8% said, uh, I was never mourning for the person. Another question they asked was how they felt right after the ADC. 80% said that it did not make the physical absence of the person more painful. 12% said it did make the physical absence of the person more painful, and 8% weren't sure. They also asked whether having the ADC made it easier to accept the person's loss. 61% said yes, it made it easier to accept their loss. 26% said it didn't make it easier to accept, and 13% weren't sure. Finally, they asked about how the people felt about, you know, overall, about having the ADC. 71% said that they treasured the fact they had it. 20% said they were very glad they had it. And if you put those two together, that's 91% indicating that they felt very positive about the experience. Of the remaining 9% or so, uh, 3.4% said they didn't mind having the experience. 0.4% said they were very unhappy with the experience. 1.1% wished it hadn't happened. And 3.5% weren't sure how they felt about it. But still, 91% treasuring or being very happy with the experience they had indicates that for most people, ADCs are very positive. What about the people who don't have them? If they hear reports of other people having ADCs when a person passes, but nothing happens to them, should they feel bad? And should they wonder why they didn't get an ADC? No, they shouldn't feel bad. Um, in the first place, is ADCs are something that don't tend to happen that often. You know, lots of people who have ADCs only hear from one person in life, and sometimes they only hear from that person once, uh, um, you know. Some people do get multiple episodes, and, uh, and some people hear from individuals more than once, but this isn't a super common phenomenon. What all that suggests is that, there, at least over the, the course of a lifetime, it doesn't tend to happen that often. And what all that suggests is that there are limits on experiences of this kind. We don't know what those experiences are. It could be that there are limits on our loved one's ability to reach out to us. You know, like maybe they, they can't do it very often. It could be that we have limits on our abilities to hear from our loved ones, and it could be that both are the case. Whatever the situation, there are unknown limits affecting this phenomenon, and so we shouldn't feel cheated or blame ourselves if we don't have any ADC. There are bunches of things that could affect this. Our loved one may have tried to reach out to us, but was unable to. It may be that they could have reached us, but they saw that we would be okay and somebody else needed a communication from one of their limited contact opportunities more than we did. I could speculate at length about all the variables that could be involved here, but the bottom line is that these are uncommon experiences. Uh, they're subject to unknown limitations. There may be good reasons our loved ones couldn't reach us, so we shouldn't feel cheated. And none of the reasons they couldn't reach us, you know, we shouldn't blame ourselves. They may not be our fault, so we shouldn't feel like we're to blame for not having an ADC. Also, just because you haven't had one yet doesn't mean you won't. As we've heard, ADCs can happen even decades after the person's death, sometimes in moments of great crisis, like when Glenda Lee's father saved her from being killed in a car crash, even though he died years earlier. So maybe you will hear from a loved one, and maybe they're saving that communication for when you really need it. Last episode, you said you'd be discussing whether you yourself have had any after-death communications. Have you? The answer is a definite maybe. I'm not sure. I have had unusual experiences in the proximities of the deaths of loved ones, and some of these have happened after the loved one died. For example, when my wife died, we found a pencil sketch in her pants pocket. Uh, nobody had known about this pencil sketch. None of us had seen it before, but it was a sketch of a female angel 
and it looked like Rene, depicted as an angel. This was very comforting for me, and it would be possible to take it as a kind of symbolic after-death communication. However, since she had made the sketch when she was alive, I would be more inclined to put this in the category of a synchronicity or meaning-filled coincidence. Similarly, when my mom died very unexpectedly, after we got home from the funeral, a package came in the mail, and there were gifts in it for all of us. For me, there was a t-shirt that was a copy of one my mother had. It was vivid blue and had a forest painted on it with a dramatic lightning bolt in puffy white paint striking the forest, so it added some texture to the t-shirt in a dramatic way. And I'd, my mom had had a copy of this t-shirt for some time, and I loved it, and I it told her how much I admired it. And when we got back from her funeral, there was a gift of the same t-shirt to me that had arrived in the mail, along with gifts from my father, my brother, and my sister. That could be considered an ADC of a symbolic nature. But my mom had undoubtedly ordered these items before she died. And so I would again put this in the category of a synchronicity or meaning-filled coincidence. Another thing that happened with my mom was when I sought to get her the anointing of the sick. Uh, she had been struck down by an aneurysm and was in the hospital in a coma. She was not a Catholic, but she was baptized, and so I asked the local priest if he could stop by her hospital room and anoint her, which he did, though I wasn't there at the time. While I was there, I went to the hospital gift shop and bought a little stuffed doll of a lamb, a, a black wool lamb. And I took it to my mother's bedside, and I gave it to her as a gift. It was hers, for however long she had left. And I used it as an, evangeliz as an evangelization tool. I reminded her about Jesus as the Lamb of God and what he did for us, hoping that it might help spark some additional openness to God on a deep level. And so that she could feel the Lamb in her coma, I stroked the back of her hands with the Lamb's paws. Months later. I was back in San Diego, and I was grieving her death. Uh, I was lying on my bed crying, and I had the stuffed lamb toy on my chest. Uh, to have a moment of connection with my mother, I held up the lamb's paws and kissed them. And suddenly, I was smelling and feeling the anointing oil that the priest had used to anoint her. I had unknowingly transferred it to the lamb's paws when I stroked the back of her hands with them, and now, months later, here it was. And since the anointing of the sick is for purposes of healing, I looked at this experience as a gift from God and perhaps my mother to help me heal in my grief. Now, there's a purely natural explanation for all this. I'd asked the priest to anoint her. I'd bought the lamb. I'd stroked the back of her hams, hands with the lamb's paw. And then I'd kissed the paws. But... I would gain, I, I would again put this in the category of a synchronicity or meaning-filled coincidence. Many ADCs occur in dreams. Have you ever had a sleep state ADC? I've certainly dreamed about my lost loved ones a lot, including Renee, my wife, and my mom and dad after they passed. In Renee's case, I had dreams about her for years, uh, where it was like she was still in her hospital bed and was dying, but still alive, or where she almost died, but then got better, or where she had died and then somehow got better. And I really valued these dreams because they gave me a chance to be with her again. But I don't have a basis for saying that they were more than ordinary dreams where I was psychologically working out what had happened and my subconscious was expressing my wish that she hadn't really died. And so I in no way consider all dreams of loved ones to be ADCs. And in that, I'm in line with many ADC experiencers who also recognize a difference between normal dreams of departed loved ones and sleep state ADCs of them. But there is one dream I had that I wonder about. It occurred very shortly after Renee died, which is in keeping with when most ADCs happen. And I didn't dream about Renee still being in the hospital, like in all the other dreams. At the time, 
in the immediate wake of Renee's death, I was staying at my parents' house so they, uh, temporarily so that I wouldn't have to be alone. And I dreamed that I was walking up the hallway of my parents' house. And coming from the other end of the hallway was Renee. I was overjoyed to see her. I rushed up to her. I picked her up off the floor in my arms. I was kissing her all over her face with joy. And then I said, but wait, you died. But she didn't want to talk about that. Now, at the time, I didn't interpret this as an ADC. I noticed that multiple other people who knew Renee had ADCs of her shortly after she died, but I didn't seem to have one. And I interpreted this as, you know, perhaps because of all the people who knew her, I had the strongest Christian faith. And that faith itself was a great consolation in the midst of grief. So uh, perhaps I didn't need an ADC as much as her friends whose faith wasn't as strong. And so maybe that's why I didn't have one. But now, I look back on that dream and think, maybe that was an ADC, and I just didn't recognize it. It was a vivid dream, although all of my dreams tend to be vivid since I have what's known as hyperphantasia, or really vivid mental imagery. And it was different than all the other dreams I had about her. She wasn't in a hospital. She was coming to see me in my parents' house where I was staying. There wasn't any weird or crazy plot to the dream, like Renee dying and then somehow recovering. It was just her meeting me in a hallway, a place of passage between two different locations, with her at one end and me at the other, which, you know, could be symbolic. And it was just a joyful reunion. Even the part where Renee didn't want to talk about her death could fit how she might have been feeling in the afterlife, because the truth was that Renee's colon cancer progressed so rapidly that she didn't have time to prepare for death. As a 27-year-old woman, she was not expecting to die at that point in her life. She only had symptoms for two months, and we only knew what it was for a month. So Renee was not emotionally prepared to die at this point. And to be honest, she remained in denial about the fact that she was going to die right up until it happened. So basically, or so based on what we've heard from other people's needs for adjustment in the afterlife in ADCs, it's quite possible that Renee was one of those people who was unhappy about the unexpected transition and needed a kind of halfway house experience to adjust to it, just like we heard about last episode with Pauline's husband, Art, who had been murdered and was being helped to adjust to the afterlife. It's thus quite understandable that Renee might not have wanted me to spoil the moment of our joyous reunion by wanting to talk about her death. And so, because the hallway dream was so unique, unlike any of the other experiences, I, or any of the other dreams I had about her, and right after her death, I wonder in hindsight if it may have actually been a sleep state ADC. I don't know that it was, but it may have been, and I just didn't recognize it at the time. Is there anything else you want to say before we close? I want to give a special thanks to Lloyd Auerbach for coming on today's program. And I want to remind you about the upcoming semester of online courses at the Ryan Education Center. Uh, this episode is airing in April, and there's a new semester of courses that will be taking place in May and June. The Ryan offers uh, professional parapsychology courses that are eight weeks or four weeks long in four semesters a year. And Lloyd teaches every semester. So you can go to Ryan edu.org to find out about all the fascinating online courses he'll be teaching this semester. And I'm also going to be teaching this semester. Uh, the Ryan asked me to do their intro to parapsychology course last fall, and it was a big success. So they've asked me to teach it again uh, going forward. And so I'm going to be teaching Introduction to Parapsychology. It's an eight-week course that's online that we'll be offering live in May and June. But you don't have to be at the lectures live. They'll all be recorded, and you'll have at least six months to watch them at your leisure. You also can either audit the course, which means just to watch it and listen to it for your own information, or you could take it for a grade. And if you pass, then you get a special certificate signed by me. It's a really interesting course, and I hope you'll join me. It covers uh, fascinating information that any fan of Mysterious World would really love. 
Furthermore, the Rhine has also asked me to teach a course on Christianity and parapsychology this August, and a course on world religions and parapsychology this fall. So by taking Intro to Parapsychology now, you can be in a good position to get the most out of the religion-themed courses that I'll be teaching later in the year. Just go to Rhine, that's R-H-I-N-E-E-D-U dot org to learn more. Once again, that's Rhine, R-H-I-N-E-E-D-U dot org. Oh, and uh, one other thing, Dom. If I pass before you, I'm going to haunt you, Bettinelli. But don't worry, it'll be sweeps, sweet smelling pipe tobacco rather than stinky cigars. I, I will be sure to make a, a special episode of that. <laughs> you have to appear on camera, Jimmy. That's, a, that's the bottom line on that one. Speaking yeah, of okay. bottom lines, uh, what is your bottom line on after death communications? After death communications are fascinating experiences. They are much more common than is usually recognized. They happen to something like 40 to 50 percent of the population at least once in a life. Uh, They are not a sign of mental illness, and they are an overwhelmingly positive experience with 91% of experiencers treasuring them or being very glad they had them. ADCs occur in many different forms. They uh, may involve a sense of presence. They may involve one or more of the five senses, and they may occur while waking or in the sleep state. When it comes to their explanation, I take an all-of-the-above approach. Some, at least a few, reports are due to hoaxes. Some may be due to mental illness, some may be due to misperception and misinterpretation, and some may be due to imagination. But many of them have multiple witnesses, and many of them contain veridical information that points to them being paranormal. While some might be due to living agent Psy, that's not how they present themselves, and without evidence to the contrary, we should interpret them as what they appear to be, actual communications with our departed loved ones. They are basically apparitions of people we know. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have a link to the Intro to Parapsychology course I'm going to be teaching, also the Guggenheim's book, Hello from Heaven, Erlander Haraldson's book, The Departed Among the Living, AfterDeath.com, and the After Death Communication Research Foundation, Jenny Straithorn's dissertation, A Systematic Review of Research on After-Death Communications, uh, the Elsacer and Others booklet on ADCs, the Elsacer and Others 2021 paper, The Phenomenology and Impact of Hallucinations Concerning the Deceased, also supplemental material to that article, uh, Woolicott and Others 2022 paper, Perceptual Phenomena Associated with Spontaneous Experiences, of after-death communications, which unfortunately is behind a paywall, and Richard Kelly's paper, Postmortem Contact by Fatal Injury Victims with Emergency Service Workers at the Scenes of Their Death. So now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about Jimmy's analysis of after-death communications? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Have you ever had an ADC yourself? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. 4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. You can check out their work, at which they're available for hire, by the way, uh, by going to uh, my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my channel so I can use your help. I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and also hit the bell notification so you always get a new video a notification when I have a new video, which usually is several times a week now. And you can also help the video by liking it and by commenting on it, because that tells YouTube's algorithm that you found the video engaging. And so other people would find it engaging too, and it'll share it with more people. So thank you very much for your uh, efforts in helping me grow my channel. And Jimmy, what's our next episode going to be about? 
Next week, we're going to be talking about an upart or out of place artifact. Uh, these are objects that seem to display a higher level of technology than we would expect from the culture in question. So next time, we're going to be looking at a strange ancient object known as the Baghdad Battery. Folks, be sure to share the podcast with your friends and write a review in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from with that allows you to write, read and review podcasts. That helps us grow our community and reach even more listeners. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 307. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. And by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. And by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>